everyone, and welcome to Bright and Early, the podcast for people building early stage startups. I'm your host, Brian Ray. I talk to entrepreneurs, product people, designers, and marketing pros to learn what works, what doesn't, and why, giving you at least one thing to apply to your business first thing tomorrow. My guest today is Josh Ho. Josh is the founder and CEO of Referral Rock, a referral marketing SaaS company for every type of business, not just e-commerce. Josh began bootstrapping the company as a side project in 2014 and has since grown Referral Rock to a remote first team of 13 doing over 70000 a month in MRR. Josh, welcome to Brighton and Early. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. Such a pleasure to have you on, man. We've had a, like a few back and forth like conversations on Twitter, I feel like, over the past several months and saw some stuff you've been posting on Indie Hackers about Referral Rock. And so, uh, yeah, when I when I found out that you were a remote only team, a remote first team, I was like, oh, this will be perfect for this little uh, remote work series. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, this should be a lot of fun. Well, so I, I mentioned it. I mentioned it there. Um, you bet you you started this as a it's like a side project in 2014, right? Correct. Um, you were doing consulting at the time. Yeah, I mean, I had a previous early SaaS business that didn't quite get. We got a little funding. We this was all in 2009, and then okay. kind of took a break and was doing consulting. That's also the time when I got married, first out, started having kids, and you know you just keep that little seed in the back of your head, just looking for ideas or looking for Mm -hmm. what you want to do next. So the, the consulting was a a means to an end at that point in time, but then uh, it allowed me to kind of have a base to move from um, and then kind of look for ideas. And once I found something that I was willing to start to commit some real time to, and that was the the start of, uh, of this iteration of my indie hacker journey, which is then. (laughs) rock now. Well, so how did you find it then? How did you the, find that referral the idea. rock was that? Yeah, was that referral rock? Was uh, the well, this kind of you know, as, as these stories go, the 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 past one burned in certain like uh, I would say constraints around the type of business or the type of SaaS business I wanted to build. So um, the previous one was called Ubernote, so it was like an Evernote competitor, that all online, that type of thing. Um, we actually had an elephant first before they did, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which makes it interesting now seeing all the productivity tools coming up nowadays with Notion and all these things. And I'm like, yeah. all these things that those were doing, those were in my notes from like 10 plus years ago. Yeah. So, but yeah. it's nice to see those, those markets mature. But my turn off after that in between on the 2009 was like, don't sell to consumers, like businesses mm. are being willing to pay. So that had me at least laser focused on you know, not worrying about and any of my little fleeting consumer ideas. You have your own ideas like, oh, I could, eh, they're never going to pay for it. Oh, they can, no, <laughs> they're going to pay for it. It's just like, it, it got me to align towards a SaaS ideas that would be for businesses. Okay. So, um, so that's where I kind of started to like frame my, my ethos around that. And then the, the idea for Referral Rock came from sitting in a car dealership and seeing someone walk in and talk about, oh, a friend sent me, you know, I'm at a Honda dealership and they're like, yeah, a friend, a friend sent me and, and to talk to this sales guy. And I'm just watching from the background and um, I see the salesperson kind of glaze over not really knowing. And he's like, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So-and-so. Yeah. The, they referred you. Yeah. They bought it such and such last month and I'll happy to show you a new accord or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I just had this moment. I'm like, that looked a little BS. I'm not sure if he actually knew what was going on. And and it just got me the wheels turning of like, okay, how does a how does a car dealership do run a referral program? Is it incentive based? How does that all work? Then it started. The ball goes a little further. Well, how does any brick and mortar types of things or service businesses, yoga studios, all these types of things? And uh, so, quick Google search. You know, you come up with at that time. You know referral candy, you know, all these, all these SaaS business ones. And you see the drop boxes and I was like, okay, this is a thing for online, but who does it for everyone else? So, you know, quick uh, registry search and uh, finding a domain name that was short enough, but seemed interesting (laughs) enough. And that's how most of my ideas start and it gets filed away. And then it, you know, as you, as it sits there, does it, does it keep coming up to you? Do you keep adding more notes to that idea? And, it got to the point where I'm starting to check those boxes that I used to have. Oh, it's selling to businesses. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do I know some people I could talk to and ask about this? Okay. Check. And you know, you just start to not 
being able to pull yourself. Uh, other ideas don't seem as shiny as as the one you have, and you start to, you know, build some mental equity in it, so to speak. And and yeah, that's where it started. Are are most of your customer, or let me ask it this way: in those early days, were most of your customers not, you know, e-commerce businesses where you where, where you traditionally think of as the as the core customer for a referral uh, referral software uh, like yours in the early part so so that was just the initial idea so then obviously going through interviewing people doing some light customer discovery mm-hmm. um, and this was over the course of probably about six or eight months of just kind of not building anything but just like seeding seeding the questions and doing some surveys and and I'll be honest, if I if I followed just what they said, it probably wouldn't ended up where I was because most of them that? were kind of lukewarm on it, right? They're like, oh, all right. Hmm. And and I didn't I reached out to people I knew, like, okay, my accountant, any business owner that I knew. And it was this really looking at that as the landscape. But I I still felt like there was enough of something there to just do something quicker and dirtier in terms of just getting something out there. Okay. So can't say I exactly followed the conventional wisdom of the customer well, discovery. And I, <laughs> so. Yeah, and I wish I wish we were having this conversation then, like really, really close to that experience to be able to right. check it out. All right. So, what what about those lukewarm conversations? Uh, <laughs> kept, had me kept going. Like, yes. Yes. I can't say. I think it was probably, and this is you know bad for all of the entrepreneurs out there, but it was more of this like can't really describe that feeling of really being drawn to that. There's something more there. Mm. Cause, and, and what I ended up with a lot of those ones were probably way too small. Like the, if okay. I, in hindsight, those are really individual practitioners. They're like, not, not like they were the one to five, maybe two bit, two people in the business, more likely just one person is really like, you know, yeah. a, a mortgage loan broker. They're like, yeah, that sounds interesting, but Okay. I don't. I don't really do a lot. I don't. I barely even have a website, or I don't even have a website. So, is it is it fair to say then that those early conversations, the folks who invalidated your idea, are actually not your target correct. customer yes, now? Anyway, that, that okay, would be cool. accurate. All yes. right. that's that's really helpful. To, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. to well, story, yeah. how how what was the process like then for you to start to shift and find who your ideal customers are? You've got a successful business now going, so you yeah, you found so you found your market. How did you do that? Most of it was just uh, so kind of at that time, you know, uh, using things like beta list and stuff were, were reasonable to do. I don't, I can't say they are <laughs> today I, or not. It correct. might be like, uh, totally agree. yeah. So at that time it was a little earlier in the cycle of this stuff. So those getting, getting on those, those types of lists and being out there was mm-hmm. a little easier to that get easier. some traction or get eyeballs on you. There weren't as many people as there are today just for starting. So, um, so with fortuitous timing of that, I was able to get some some eyeballs getting some getting some light you know people kind of talking about or some light backlinks and some other stuff i will aid to this so this this did really help uh, it's kind of a little i wouldn't say a dirty secret type of thing so ubernote past going back to the past a little bit generated a good amount of backlinks i did some basic seo stuff with it initially so um with the shutdown of that i still had the domain and everything so i mean there were good backlinks to Life hacker and some other things of that day sure. that we did that sure. we got some publicity around. So I did write kind of a if you even go to ubernote.com, it redirects to a to a referral rock page that's kind of my uh, you know post mortem on referral on on, on, on Ubernote. Ubernote. Okay. And uh, to at least it had backlinks to the domain. So I did not totally start that from a cold start. But yeah. with with that and enough little basic SEO, we started a trickle of people kind of finding us through 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 those through those initial um, initiatives through uh, beta list and some basic SEO pieces. So yeah. we had enough of a drip of some things. So then once those came in, um, then there was uh, probably a lot more heavy handed uh, customer discovery with people that were coming in the door. So it was like, okay, they know they have a problem to solve of some sort. They want to get more referrals. And now that was about, we had a very rudimentary product at that point in time. So it was a lot of intercom chats and then which led to phone calls or scheduling like more mm-hmm. interviews. And, and really it started with not necessarily, my intent was not to make it an interview is more to just understand their problems. I and mean, this truly is what it ends up being, you know, saying like, okay, so you're interested in doing a referral program. Like what, you know, 
what type of program, what do you, what do you need out of this? Oh, this offer can do this. Oh, this offer can do that. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, if you, if you, if it could do this for you, would you be willing to pay for that? And if you pay today, like I can have that feature in a week. (laughs) So it was that kind of early, you know, and at that point we had a few people using the basic MVP version. And then as I, as I iterated with, with a steady drip of a faucet of people coming in, started to kind of refine what the right features were, what were Mm -hmm. the people really asking. And and we did start out at the get go with that line of like that you mentioned in the beginning, which is like, was not for, uh, you know, for any business, not just e-commerce, because that yes. was the yes. status quo. If you went and searched for soft referral software, the top results were all e-commerce based. So mm-hmm. I was like, that's Which fine. And, yeah. and, and we've never wanted to battle in that space yet. We'll see. Um, but <laughs> at this point, we're like, let's carve out our little messaging just because that was what I thought was our initial differentiator. Yeah. And it proved to at least get enough people in the door. Now, now today we do have a lot of e-commerce customers. They find us in other ways, but but that's where that the, I would say the real core discovery part your happened. initial foothold back there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I, um, I want to ask you a bit, you know, or not a bit, a lot about your experience growing referral rock as a remote first team. Sure. So at, at what point along the way did you realize, okay, we need to start hiring some full-time folks and what was, what was your thought process like in, in hiring those initial hires? Sure. So starting with the remote part, which was so since the Ubernote and consulting, I've been I've been working remotely or out of my like home office or home space for I guess since I left my other company to start Ubernote. So this was two thousand six. So okay. 13, 13 plus years. years. Yeah. I've been, you know, at my own desk <laughs> in my own space. Uh, through the transition of having kids and all of that stuff, they they've just they haven't known any difference. So when I started Referral Rock, it was just kind of like this is my lifestyle. This is how I do things. So um, the initial going through that kind of like I told you that period of the initial faucet trip, I didn't have anyone else and that was just me at that point in time. And um, the first thing I was looking to do was scale and hire certain things that I was doing. I was like, oh, we could use some more blog posts and something like that. So I looked okay. for kind of a general, a generalist that could help like write help docs, do some blog posts, that type of thing. So, um, and that was like the first person I brought on and it was, you know, you're first thinking kind of freelancer. And I think, I think initially I did pay them 1099 and then okay. it was probably about, once we had maybe three or four people that we decided to flip the bit and say, okay, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to do things through like gusto or whatever and actually do proper, you know, W2s and things like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Okay. For uh, international listeners, 1099 is U S tax code for a freelance employee, not a, not a full-time employee. Um, so, and what were the challenges that you faced like early on, right off the bat in, in making those, in making those hires? Uh, I think the, the biggest challenges were probably just since I did it very slowly, it was never a, you know, since we're as basically like, here's our revenue, here's what I need help with. Here's what I can pay. Here's what I need to bring on. It was very an iterative, slow type of bring a person on. It was, if you look at the averages, probably, we probably grew by maybe like two people a year, like mm-hmm. kind of through the cycles. Um, but because of that slow roll, and in the beginning, we had a lot of generalists. And as you start to grow, you start to kind of go down more specialist routes. Yeah. And as I brought people on, um, it became obvious like onboarding was needed because we were all remote. So it's like, okay, when you have someone first start, we weren't even thinking of like, okay, what are the traditional paradigms of someone coming into a traditional like office type of company? So we immediately were gravitating towards, oh, well, then you're going to need some training. What do we have out of our stuff? Let's make some slide decks. Let's make some stuff. Like, hey, this person's starting next week. How are we going to bring them on? So it kind of was like a, you know, a little further out than your nose, you kind of start going, <laughs> okay, where are they going to fall down? And yeah. where are we, what, what do we have? What assets do we have? Can we glue together? Um, oh, great. Like part of our onboarding, actually even part of our interview process which was to even get ahead of the curve even further with early employees. It was like, okay, you know what? We have a little mini project. Design your own referral program for this fake company. Mm -hmm. So that was like a interview test. So it kind of helped us. It initially onboarded them a bit on our software and our scope and some of the questions. So we were even doing 
I would say some onboarding, employee onboarding, like in the interview process as yeah. part of a, a way of transitioning that. What What is that onboarding process look like now? How uh, how much does it resi- how much does it resemble your first few drafts and how has uh, it evolved over the years? I, Fortunately, I don't run that part anymore, which is great. But I have a great, awesome team where they were, my initial ones for them were like, hey, here are a bunch of videos that I did and that I, we, we just came up with a smattering of different topics. So we were doing these series internally for internal training. And that was like the very first version of when we started to kind of formalize. It was like, okay, so we've kind of trained people in general, these two or three people we have with these office hour types of style things that. I was at least, we were at least smart enough to say, let's at least record them on zoom. (laughs) Uh, And then those turned into like the first, okay, here's a five day series of like, do this, watch this video, answer these questions type of thing. So, um, and then today it actually is, I think it's about, I think it's about a month long process. So we did have some, the the newest version, we had two people being onboarded about, um, I'd say about a month and a half ago. So they're, they're, they're on the, the shiniest version and it's a it now it's uh broken up between there's some videos there's some tasks but they it's pretty much well tracked out what everyone has to do over the course of about a month and i think it each day is intending on invest them investing about half their time so i know when an employee starts like i'm not getting their full time until about a month out but they're they'll i'll have trickling of tasks that they'll they'll do depending on their role but they could pretty much mark out the first month on about half of their days doing some training, working with the facilitator. Some of them are live. Some of them are like, check in with the facilitator. Here's a couple mm-hmm. little things you're going to have to do. Here's some videos to watch. Here's a project. Actually, at the end of all of them, I think they all of them will do a like a sales demo. So departed, no matter what your role is, you will do a sales demo by the end. Um, that's interesting. Is there is that a service that you're using to um, to operate and track all of that, or is it fully homebrewed? Uh, it's just yeah, using the tools we have. So I think it's a lot. We use um, Confluence for wikis now. I think most of that stuff is in Confluence now, in addition to probably some spreadsheets for people to like check off their their things. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you shared any of that? But like, it just—it sounds like a really good process that you've you've thought through and refined over the year. You and your team. Uh, yeah, that that isn't so. anything we've ever 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 shared. Outside. Okay. All right. Just it sounds pretty. Heard it here first. And, Heard it here first. <laughs> sounds helpful, guys come. And, <laughs> helpful and detailed. Right. Um, you know, one of the most common challenges that remote teams often cite and employees often cite is communication, and just feeling like communication on a fully remote team is it requires a level of discipline and shared expectations, et cetera, et cetera, right. that, that, you know, co-location just kind of does by default almost. So what have, what's been your team's approach to this or what, what challenges have you all faced? And uh, uh, I think over, over the time we've figured out kind of a, I would almost call it like a internal operating system that has worked really well. So, um, I did mention Confluence, so that is one of the pieces. If I could talk about like the main kind of, I don't know if you call them like workflows or or just just areas. So I, I, I count on, on, so we talked about Zoom. So mm-hmm. for direct communication one-on-ones, we're always using Zoom. Um, even from the beginning interview process, we will have them do video because if they're okay. not comfortable on video and just being like, hey, I'm in my pajamas today, whatever, like there's a lot of, you know, with remote, you still need, you, since you're not, I can't hear you, I can't see you face to face, but this is the closest thing. And you see people's mannerisms, you see people, um, you know, on different days, you see a background change, and you're like, hey, hey, where are you today? You know, it's, it helps just create that other little, like, glue that is kind of around. Um, obviously, we, we're, we're, we're big users of Slack, but we do it in a we created rules around it early on in terms of like, and these all just kind of uh, matured over time, but okay. you know, certain types of channels or when to use Slack versus not Slack is not the go-to all the time. So we do try to keep the disruption down and we do have specific kind of classifications of channels and how we do that. Um, and I'm sure you want to ask more questions about any one of these, but I'll get through the whole scope. Yeah. Um, but there's yeah. a, and then obviously we have confluence. So confluence is our like process documentation. So 
all of these types of things I'm talking about are more or less kind of written in Confluence. You know, how, how we use those, how we section out different teams and, and things like that in there. There's a whole page on all the onboarding stuff like we discussed earlier. Um, and then the, the last one that I feel like is the one that probably gets the most usage is, is like our project management tool. So we use Asana. Um, I'm, it, it works really well with the way we work. Um, not we work the company, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, and, and that is even in our, in our onboarding or even stuff we talk about is like, if you can talk about, if, if something is asked about a task or a project like use it and have the the conversation in context on the task item. So whether mm-hmm. I'm going there, Ryan, let's say we're part of the same project and we're working on some new onboarding emails or something like that. And there's a task item and you're holding the bag, which means you're assigned as the person and you have a question. Hey, Josh, what do you think about this? Or something like that. Instead of that going to Slack, our preference is gravitate everyone towards Asana first. So it's like the context of the conversation can be for the right people that right. opt into it without disrupting anyone else. Um, right. If there's a if there's a very timely element to it, you're like, hey, I'm about to push release on this too. Yeah, sure, go to Slack. Like if you need an immediate response, but otherwise letting people like keeping the stuff in Asana and using Asana's ways of managing like notifications and inboxes and nice functionality they have in there. I'm not sure your familiarity. Yeah. With yeah. Yeah. I've got a client where we uh, communicate over Asana right now. So do you, do you have, um, is there company wide expectations or policies on here are your notification settings in Slack and in Asana and in Confluence and everybody uh, has the same notifications? Or... I think we, I think we let everyone manage how they want to okay. do their notifications, but okay. we do recommend. So it's just like I recommend everyone with Asana. I was like, turn off the email notifications and live out of that like inbox feed. I was like, it's yes. great because if someone makes twenty changes to it, it's rolled up as one. You don't get twenty email notifications over the course of the day and have to understand and replay the narrative yourself. You can just see the summary item or. Like the way they do that is probably one of the best features I feel like that it does within yeah. within that. And no one ever really talks about it. <laughs> what's the what's the response time expectation within your company on a an Asana mention or a Slack mention? Like uh, I think the Asana ones are definitely looser because that is definitely more of the async type of thing. Yeah. And um I would say the average response time is probably like within a day uh, and it's probably like down to a, like a couple hours Yeah, is probably like the average depending on the, the item. And then the Slack responses are a lot faster. So people know if they need something more, like I said, more immediate, they know to go to Slack and there's specific channels where you can go direct to a person for Slack. So right. There's there. I would say that the average response for someone doing things in there is probably down to maybe like an hour because yeah. there might be, you know, you could be in a meeting, you could be other things. There's an understanding that other people are doing other things that not sure. to get them out of their flow or whatnot. Yeah. Is is there an expectation then at Referral Rock that Slack is, if, if you're during work, if you're on your work hours, Slack is open? Yes, there is. Yeah. How, is that, I mean, that's definitely something that's coming up very, very frequently these days and has, and has been for a little while, mm-hmm. you know, the obvious and well-documented benefits of Slack and real-time chat, like what an innovation. Very sure. cool. Oh yeah, definitely. Turns out it can also be really distracting and keep knowledge workers from getting into flow. Mm-hmm. So how do you think about that and how is your team handling that challenge? Uh, well, one thing that's a little different too is like there, we probably classify the different types of roles here in different ways. Like there still is, we have a customer success team and a sales team. So they, they are operating a little differently. The more of their, their first initial stuff is all coming, um, based off events from customers first. Like that's their, their first piece. So, um, what kind of changes the paradigm for them is they're, they're not, I guess they're not as much about a flow type of type of role necessarily, like where we would the product team or the marketing team writing articles or doing yes. things like yeah. that. So there's kind of like a a slight, I guess, a delineation with that. Um, you know, and, and obviously, like I said, people can t- 
turn off their notifications. They can turn off their, I think half of it for us was really, like I said, the part of the, what we've created inside is a culture that where people are going to Asana first. So that is less disruptive in your face. So I think most of those things, um, if you were to look at like the channel conversations, like there is a team product or a team marketing channel, there's really not much in there unless it's, it's more announcement based if it's in Mm -hmm. there. And then we do use the direct messaging for individual things, but I don't think a lot of people, and I could ask, I mean, I only know for myself in terms of the interaction of direct messaging, yeah. but sometimes I'll tag two people that I need to, or we have like a senior staff channel that only people are, you know, for, for certain senior managers and things like that, that might be apparent to that. So I think because of right now, fortunately, the way we've started it from the beginning, we didn't have people kind of we had more of a groundswell on how people were using these tools and when to use what that we've, we've we're on the fortunate side of like, it's kind of always been done this way. And if you were walking in the door, you'd quickly see you're probably like not <laughs> you're swimming upstream by the way you're doing things or this isn't the way everyone else is doing things. Mm-hmm. So um, we haven't had any, I don't think we've had any too many problems in there in terms of disruption. Cause most people are pretty like on the same team, everyone, you know, there's, there's certain times when there's meetings. We also use meetings, get pre-scheduled meetings to help block the, uh, I would say those, the types of conversations that could be interruptive. Like, do you, you know, do you really need this? And if not, I have like stopgap meetings. Like we'll have a weekly, we have weekly meetings with product that helps a lot. So if there's questions, it gets, it gets either bottled up to there. So that's another part of our thing. Like the, the meeting schedules help, okay. um, people know that uh, that they can bring up something in a different time, like to not, it's like, this doesn't make sense to just interrupt someone to do. So yeah. if anything, they, for example, if you and me were, uh, you know, both uh, working on the same project and we have, let's say we're continuously working on product together. If you are a direct report of mine, we'd probably have two meetings a week um, at like set up for an hour as one-on-ones. And then we also have this Asana meeting board that's a one-on-one Brian and Josh meeting board. Mm-hmm. There's the t- first topic area that has this discussion section, an in-progress section, and a punt for later who cares section. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then what we do is, for example, if I'm going to be meeting with you tomorrow, all the little small little questions of other things that I can, can wait, I start archiving them in the discussion. Now, yeah. if you pre-answer them or go in there, and comment on them before we might have a discussion in Asana that is non-interruptive of your yours or yeah. mine deep work. But if once the meeting comes up, we look and see the discussion, and we just run through our discussion items. So I think that's been an important piece that helps completely. So prevent the interrupt. It's like there's a know, separate, everyone, there's yeah, a separate the type place. of meetings you but yeah the type the type of message or question you might have. There's a there's a place for that. Yeah, so, and so people are less likely to just throw some question that happens to be on their mind into Slack and it right. spins everybody off on some rabbit trail. And yeah, where does, so you've mentioned, okay, Confluence, Zoom, Slack, and Asana. Where does, e, where does email fit in, in terms of communication and expectation and how thoughts are shared and, and conversations sure. happen at Referral Rock? So with all of those in play, there actually isn't a hole for email. <laughs> It's kind of, it wasn't by design this way, but I think by using these, the tools you mentioned first, it, what, what it, what it ends up evolving to is there is seldom any internal email at all. Most of them are like forwards of things, if it makes sense. So we might get an exception message for me and I see it and I might use that because the payload is the message and forward it to one of my guys or just say, or I might even just cut and paste the, you know, the location of it and put it in. So it is rare that there's any internal email. Now, e- external email for certain roles like customer success and sales, that's their, its own beast. Of but course. from an internal email perspective, like I c- other than getting, a, hey, calendar invites, aside from that, it's like super low. It's there's, I don't, I don't, I mean, we could probably almost, if someone got shut out of their email, like it probably really wouldn't affect their work very much. That's really interesting. Um, I, the other the other challenge that remote teams and remote employees cite often uh, as a as a challenge to overcome is just feelings of loneliness and isolation. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious if that is something that that your team has 
talked about and worked through or what, what have your experiences uh, there been? Personally, I haven't had that. Um, and maybe it's also because I have so much interaction with all the little tentacles of stuff of kind of mm-hmm. coming, coming down from the top. But uh, in addition to being from being at home and, you know, my wife is oftentimes over there and it's like, I'm popping my head out to, to grab some food. We might be chatting or she, I might have the look at like, no, I, I have a thought I'm going like, I'm just here to grab food. Don't bother me <laughs> type of thing. <laughs> so there uh, from the family side, there's a lot of, just like loose, just kind of interaction. So my mm-hmm. office space is them and, and the kids at times when they're home. So there might be little interactions there and there. So for me, I'm not sure it's the same as, as, as everybody else. Um, now internally with the team, I don't think it, it'd be a good question. And that's maybe something I should ask uh, kind of on our next kind of team survey, but I don't think it comes up too much. Most mm-hmm. of the people I have have it. And I think again, with the, the the cadence of the different meetings, the one on ones, like I said, there's um, there's the one on ones we discussed about. If you were, you know, a, a direct report, there's um, other there's there there's other activity to kind of know what's going on with the team and channels for discussion. So we also have like a hashtag winning channel for like automations. Like a new sale comes in that gets posted, so you get a lot of like you know, emoji icons on them and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's these light touch kind of um, interactions that do make it feel like a team. Um, And the fact that we're, we run in mostly East coast hours, I think also helps too. So people know, like I said, it's, it's kind of indicative of who's working if they have their little Slack icon, you know, is a, has the little green, green thing on it. So I think that kind of almost works as like the collective space. So then there are much the winning channel stuff, we actually have each team post different things over the course of the week. So like CS, the customer success team, will post kind of a list of all the things that they've done that week. So it kind of sometimes inspires some some conversations in there. So, you know, hey, I just finished this great onboarding sequence and like here's some screenshots and you might put that in the winning channel and you might get people asking questions like, oh, that's awesome. Good job, Brian. And this, so that there's, there are those interactions that I wouldn't say we purposely built them all in, but then at some point it was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. How can just we happens, fit yeah. this into our operating system? Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We also have daily stand up things. Uh, okay. Oh, I, want, I was going <laughs> to, yeah, sure. this is, this is, this uh, segues pretty nicely into this because you're all of your, all of your team, you are fully distributed hundred uh, percent remote, but everybody's in the United States. Is that right? Uh, everyone is a United States like authorized worker, citizen, whatever. So there are people that have taken advantage of the remote like flexibility. So we do have right now, I think there might be at least two that are in South and Central America. Okay. Um, so which for East Coast time works largely well, like within okay. an hour, let's go back and forth. Okay. So, so there's still, okay. Yeah, I guess that that's, that would be the better way to ask it is not everybody's in the US, but you all are pretty pretty closely aligned on time zones yes so there's a lot of overlap of everyone's work day right yes okay okay so then um how how do you do like daily check-ins or stand-ups is that video uh, how, how do you how do you run that sure so for a team perspective we'll say like the product team for example there is a weekly team meeting usually at the beginning of the week um it technically was during this time, <laughs> but I uh, <laughs> had to message people. I'm like, I can't either make it if it can go on without me, but someone else is sick. So we actually moved it to tomorrow. Okay. Um, but there's a weekly product team meeting um, and they go through, you know, kind of product planning for the week. And that one is all over Zoom, live okay. video. Um, and the, the time has moved around a bit, like, but within a general scope, we have one new team member that is a US person, but he actually lives in, um, he does live in Europe. Um, and my general rule for any of those is like, okay, you can be anywhere you want. Um, at least we should have, depending on the role, a certain amount of crossover. So we have at least four or five hours. I'm also with the the young kids. I'm up early anyway. So having a call with him at seven in the morning isn't a big deal for me. Um, but, uh, but we're cognizant of his time. So like the product meetings usually aren't any later than like noon. So he's not like getting into dinner time. Right. Right. 
Okay. Um, and then, so that's like a weekly thing. And then I told you about the one-on-ones, but the other one we do is we do use a, um, like a Slack based standup kind of a bot type of thing. So, um, and what it does is for, for example, for the product team, we do them actually at the end of the day instead. So it's kind of almost a like a round up what you did. And there's, you know, the three kind of stand up questions. Like, what'd you get? So ours shifted a little. It's like, what did you get done today? What do you plan tomorrow? And do you have anything blocking you? Nice. So yeah. there's a bot that goes out at around, I think it should be around 4 p.m., whatever your time is. So you're okay. kind of getting that in and thinking about it before you round up a little too late. People forget about it and their kind of head is out the door. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we found like, the, the four o'clock range was around the good time for people okay. to kind of answer those. And those get all reposted in your individual team channel. So a uh, personal custom bot or a service that uh, it's a service. Like. So I think we used, we were initially using, I can't remember the name of it, but it was, it was a, it was very well polished. Uh, I actually ended up having a, a minor annoyance with the way their pay structure was because we have, I wanted to deploy it for the whole team. So we have the team ones and not every team has a daily standup. Like it, it doesn't make sense for the sales team to have a daily. It's almost annoying to them to be asked these questions every okay. day. Okay. Um, but they have a, across the whole company, we also ask a weekly question on Friday, similar style. It's what did you get done this week? What are you planning for next week? And then we change the question every week to being some fun, random, like, <laughs> what's the, you know, what was your biggest interview snafu thing, you know, or last week's was something like, if you're in a zombie apocalypse, who are the three people you would <laughs> want on your team? Like, right. so right. we have someone on our team changing that question every week. So that's every Friday, but that goes across everyone in the company. So everyone gets to see that and kind of enjoy a little bit of getting to know everyone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the, uh, would you say are some of the unglamorous aspects of remote work that some leaders and team members should be prepared for if they're getting ready to, to go remote? The unglamorous parts? I yeah. Don't know. It's hard to, I mean, I'm all for how, how it works. So I don't, I, I think the big thing to know as we kind of alluded to, and I, I fell into, which is. Uh, yeah, the big things I would talk about with remote that are it's things that are important to understand. So the East Coast thing was kind of a big thing. Like I, I kind of started it as just a for selfish reasons. Like we had a we had a guy early on, one of our developers, he's still with us, and his intent was to travel and go to the Philippines. I'm like, great, but I'm not going to get up in the morning to talk to you. If you want to shift your hours to whatever, as long as within reason, like we're good. <laughs> So I think locking into a time zone still helps Mm -hmm. to kind of, I know some people, they go for remote and remote might mean like asynchronous work across 24 seven and this kind of thing. And that is not us. So um, I think that constraint helps a lot and helps that transition. So just because you're going remote does not mean you have to go full board async, like 24 seven. The other piece is uh, I think the, Finding the right people, um, I think, and, and I don't, I wouldn't recommend anyone that is first starting a job or if you're getting a person in as a, I don't have any work experience and throwing into a remote, there's probably just way too much to tackle. So the people you're going to, that fit best are ones, obviously, if they've had remote work experience, but I think I've had a minimum two to three years on the job. So you're not a lot of the nuance of, let's say, bringing on a developer and how to use a Git repository. A lot of that is so much easier in person versus trying to like train someone remotely for that type of thing. So I wouldn't recommend any early like, hey, I've never had a job type of thing. Um, and and then which also alluded to what we discovered is like all of that onboarding stuff we were doing um, happened by circumstance, right? So and and I would say the disadvantage of that is like you're because you're not getting the people in a room understanding what everyone's doing and understanding it talking um, is like you do have to be you know more upfront about those training processes up front. And we kind of mm-hmm. I'm kind of a process nut and a documentation nut. So then that <laughs> that kind of alluded to those and making sure that that was efficient and can we reuse that video that I did and how can we reuse that and and so I think knowing that when you're first starting up, you're going to have to do some of these bigger company process things a lot earlier because you're not going to be able to benefit from the, hey, 
me and Brian are just chilling in a room and we get it. We can talk about it while mm. we're doing our work. So that stuff I feel like is going to pay for itself more. But at the same time, if you were in, a, in an office, it probably wouldn't happen until you were 10 or 12 people that you would need to think about formalizing. Cause you could be like, Oh, um, just sit down and shadow Brian for this week and you'll kind of get it. Like yeah. we can't do that. So yeah. we had to invest a lot more up front. Um, so, so someone's flipping the bid or starting that way. These are the, these are the tougher things you're going to have to learn to do earlier that sitting in an office, you probably wouldn't have to be concerned about. Mm-hmm. Those are helpful. Thanks. Do you, do you all, um, if I mentioned it, do you all schedule company retreats or summits once, twice uh, a year, anything like that? That's Have you interesting. Done that before? That's, that's, we haven't yet. We haven't done any. We've done a couple little gatherings that have been just based off of like serendipitous people visiting certain areas. We had a person that was, uh, I think she was in North Carolina at the time, and she was visiting up in the Baltimore area for a wedding. So we're like, oh, we should meet that person. And we do have a few there are if anything there is like three or four of us that are in the dc area so we could get some people together um so we've we've never had at any point in time everyone on the team together um but there's there's been two events in our history over the course of the years where we had enough people or someone visiting from another like visiting home from another country we're like oh that's a good opportunity let's see who we can who, who we can gather up and if people want to do that so that's kind of like the serendipitous part of it, but it, it has been in my mind to kind of think about that. And I'm mm-hmm. not sure I, where I a hundred percent land on it. Like, cause yeah. I could see where people talk about the benefits you see, but for you see pictures right. of people doing all these right. retreats and I'm not sold. Cause I, when I start to actually think of the mechanic pieces, I'm like, well, I have people in sales and customer success. I, are we going to shut down for a week? what can we do? Who's planning this? Like, how can I best do this? I do want people to get to know each other, but how much, you know, so I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I'm not sold on it either way. Uh Um, I'd like to do something for the team, but I do think like a reward for the team is something. So we're hopefully approaching a, a mile mark soon, like getting to the million ARR mark soon. So that's something in the back of my head that maybe it's like, okay, maybe we'll do like a gathering right now. The working thought is maybe we'll do like a long weekend type of thing where everyone gets a day off, but I will pay for people to go there, but you don't necessarily necessarily have to take work time off, but then it allows for like a, it's not like a structured, Hey, here's our company initiatives for the year. Cause that planning requires a lot, a lot of foresight and to kind of, get everyone together on that same thing. So yeah, I start to think of like what a lot are the of true pieces. benefits. There's a lot, yeah. there's a lot, there's yeah. a lot. So Great. I'll let you know when I come up with a, what we'll actually do. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, how can listeners find and follow you online, Josh? Uh, I'm relatively active on Twitter. Um, I love Twitter from just the networking aspect. I mean, that's how we first kind of started having some conversations. Um, and uh, that's probably the best way to kind of reach and see what, brain dumps are coming out of me. I'm not yeah. too, too wordy on many things, maybe a few, few original tweets a week or so, but yeah. that's probably the best way. J logic. Yeah. J logic. Yep. The letter J logic yep. mm-hmm. and referralrock.com. Folks can go if they are curious to learn more about your product there. Yep. Definitely. All right. My guest today has been Josh Ho. Josh, thanks so much for everything you shared. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. Great stuff with Josh there. Let's do some closing thoughts. I love the origin story for Referral Rock that Josh is sitting in a Honda dealership and watches this watches this interaction and thinks, huh, there might be there might be something there. Um, I love that. And it's also interesting to me that his early discovery interviews uh, were were rather lukewarm. And that uh as he kind of pointed out, you know, he's just ignored a little bit of the conventional wisdom there and continued to follow his gut that that he was that he was onto something and that there was a need, which turned out to be true because he was the, the lukewarm feedback he was getting was from the wrong uh, customer. Uh, and when he found his target customer, he did start to get actionable feedback and uh, and found that he was 
in fact, onto something. So that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind, being sure that you're getting feedback from the right people, from the right market, which reminds, kind of reminds me of, uh, Ben Ornstein in episode 25, how, uh, how focused uh, he and the, his co-founders at Tuple were on being very picky in particular about who is going to be our first batch of customers so that you know that the feedback that you're getting, you can act on. Um, just reminded me of that and, and seemed like another uh, what's like perspective or another point of view on why that, uh, why that is, is so important to be sure that you're listening to the right people that you're talking to the right market. Um, let's see. I found, I found it pretty interesting that, you know, their, their early, uh, employee interviewing and onboarding process was like plan, you know, planned out just past their nose, I think he said. Um, and then became a week's worth of classes based on some of these other, you know, calls that they've been recording. And it is now a month long process where, you know, half of an employee's day for that month is all about training and onboarding. And so just, it, it seems like, uh, you know, something interesting to, to learn, um, and, and observe there, uh, something's better than nothing, Let's record what we're doing. <laughs> Let's improve on it as we go. Uh, save ourselves some time in the future until it, at some point it is it's a you know a more well refined uh, process. So um, I'd, I'd be really curious what if you're if you're a remote worker or if you're managing remote teams, what your what the onboarding process is like and how much of that you know is um, you know kind of uh, recorded. Um, online curriculum, so to speak, either in presentations or, or recorded conversations, that sort of thing. Um, or if, if pieces of it are, you know, as Seanick last week um, described, it's a one-on-one -on -one call where he goes through the handbook with somebody online or, you know, uh, sorry, in real time. Um, super fascinating. I like, I like when, uh, you know, Josh was talking about their, their toolkit basically being Zoom, Slack, Confluence, and Asana. Um, and that there's really actually not even that much room for email at Referral Rock. That's interesting. But but those four tools, Zoom, Slack, Confluence, Asana, and you can imagine pretty easily, like just, you know, trade, you know, Basecamp for Asana or Trello for Asana. Um, trade Skype for Zoom if you want or Confluence with whatever wiki you might use. But, you know, that those kind of form the pillars of how remote teams work. Um, you know, face-to-face -face conversation, uh, synchronous chat, uh, a wiki, and then project management tools. And, but that's, it's not enough to say these are the, these are the four things that we're going to use, or this is our, this is our toolkit. The really important part of that um, is what are your, what are the notification uh, recommendations or like, or more, even more important than that, what are the notification agreements? How, how quickly are you expected to respond on Slack and under what conditions? How quickly are you expected to uh, respond to a message on Asana? Um, and, and it even, you know, it sounded like it's, it's even delineated by role um, at Referral Rock that, you know, somebody in customer success might be expected to have Slack open all day, every day. Um, whereas, you know, somebody in, uh, somebody in marketing who's, you know, be writing articles, um, is maybe only expected to check in, you know, two or three times per day. Uh, I think, I think those, those agreements are what are so important in understanding why someone in a certain role might have a particular expectation and, so how can we how can we find a way to to be sure that that's working and and communicate that? Don't let, just let it kind of emerge, so that employees are like, yeah, you know, so and so they don't really respond on Slack as often. You should you know send them or whatever. But but um, that it's well at our company, people in customer success has Slack open all day every day, and it's because we use this particular channel where so and so over in operations knows they need to keep an eye on this regularly because that is where we, you know, ask this question regularly. Um, those sorts of agreements are just so, so important. Um, and I can, I can say for sure, just thinking back, like 
that that the uh, that the expectations usually emerge rather than uh, being documented and communicated, like just the sort of thing that just kind of that happens unless you unless you define it, and often just letting it happen usually leads to misunderstanding. So um, so I think that's I think that's really really important. Uh, let's see. I the I'm still just wondering on this on uh, about Slack. Um, everybody uses it, and I I just I feel like um, unless, uh, yeah, what's, what am I, what am I thinking through here? Just that unless uh, teams and people are deliberate about how to use real time chat, um, for a lot of, for a lot of people over time, I think it's probably a net negative. Um, and so I, I just, I, I wonder if part of those agreements can be the sort of thing where, um, if somebody doesn't want to have Slack open all day, every day, completely understand we're good with that. Um, what does it look like for your workflow to be like a Pomodoro sequence of 20 minutes on, five minute break, and every three Pomodoros, can you pull open Slack and just uh, check to see if there's an urgent message for you? Um, relate, related to that, I think that would reduce the number of those urgent messages that come through is what Josh is talking about, about having regularly scheduled meetings. And so like so much of those interruptive, Hey, so-and-so can you double blah, 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 um, that, that come across over Slack or in a one line email, you know, usually those happen because the person doesn't have some other trustworthy, uh, trustworthy place to put that and to ask themselves the question of, is this a question for Slack? Is this something I should throw into a sauna? Is this just a paragraph I should add to our company wiki? Or is this something that I can add to this, to, to the agenda of Thursday's meeting? Because I know that Thursday's meeting is going to happen. Um, so it feels like putting that sort of thing in place uh, that when it does come across email unnecessarily or does come across Slack as an interruptive message to be able to say, uh, hey, good question. Let's let's add that to Thursday's meeting, and let that be the answer. You know, how many times does that need to happen until like, okay, this we are now establishing a culture of communication here, and this is how this is how this works. Let's see the you know the the stand up bot, um, like having a, a bot run your stand ups. At the end of the day, first of all, I thought that was great. Um, <laughs> I uh, you know most often think about stand ups happening in the morning, but I think he's got a, a good point there about um, the the helpfulness of it coming at the end of the day. Um, what I like about it being a bot, and you'll hear this in next week's episode with Marie Prokopetz from um, FYI, um, is that when it's a bot, like. Hey, it's just the process. It's it's just the way that that we do things here. Um, it's not personal, and it's not your manager like tapping you on the shoulder. What you're working on? What you're working on? And it's beneficial for employees um, because it ensures that you are you are proactively keeping your work visible. Um, this is a problem. This is one of the challenges of remote works that employees and managers actually will cite over time. Is that um, people's work sometimes becomes a little bit too invisible if they are not naturally natural promoters <laughs> or natural presenters or champions of their work, which is a separate, you know, a separate soft skill that comes naturally to some and doesn't come naturally to others. That uh, people's work can be can be missed, um, and so uh, this has two great benefits. Um, it coaches and helps the employee to uh, to communicate their work um, and to make it visible to the team. And it also helps the manager not to be put in the position of, you know, I haven't heard from so-and-so in a good, you know, several days or even a week. Uh, okay, what exactly is it that they're working on? And of course, ideally, there are other venues that you can go to find those things, like what 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 tasks have they ticked off on Asana, Trello, or Basecamp, or whatever. Um, but, you know, a lot of, sometimes the, you know, just bullet list task items don't really communicate um, the importance of what you're working on. And so having that sort of process in place is, is super important. 
Um, so I, I appreciated that part of the conversation and, and thinking through that from, from several sides of it. And let's see, yeah, legit concerns there about how to run a remote, uh, uh, how to remote, uh, sorry, a, a company summit, uh, uh, a retreat. That's the word I was trying to think of that starts with RE. Um, like what, what do you do? How do you, how do you shut down for a week? Um, and, uh, back to, you know, last week's episode with Seanick and, um, just remembering, you know, how one second every day, you know, runs that to, to shut down, you know, all functions for the week. But then on Friday, uh, particularly for customer success, everybody dives in. Um, Josh brought up specifically the sales team. I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, how if uh, how exactly the rest of the team can jump in on on uh, sales, <laughs> keeping the sales pipeline moving. Um, probably some more specific uh, specific concerns there that that remain legitimate and um, definitely would would present a challenge. But um, yeah, the it it sure. It, it sounds and feels like um, just the importance of getting people at the same place, you know, in, in a room at the same time or on location together when the vast majority of your time, your, your, you know, uh, avatars on the other side of a keyboard, um, super important for, for building teams. So lots of great, lots of great topics uh, in this, in this episode. I'm already loving um, this series and uh, going to have a, a good one for you next week with, with Marie um, that I think, I think that you will enjoy the final, the last thing that I'll, I'll say here um, is the reason I'm doing this is I'm personally interested in, uh, in the growth of, uh, of remote work and the increasing volume of individual people who are working remotely now um, and the the challenges that that will present to both the employee and the employer and so um, I'm I'm starting to, to spin up a little project uh, it's called headlamp and you can go to projectheadlamp.com and I haven't I haven't built a whole lot of software for it just yet um, some uh, but not a lot and uh, I'm just very interested in understanding the problems that remote work presents to employees and managers and owners and to find ways to help employees feel fulfilled, um, feel connected, um, a part of a team um, to do their best work. Um, and so, uh, and to, and to help managers uh, facilitate that. So, um, if you're if you're interested in uh, in staying um, up to date on what it is that I'm working on, um, and and chiming in, and maybe even being an early an early customer of some of the services, uh, either consulting services or or uh, software products that I start to build, you know, around this around this, then hop on over to projectheadlamp.com. There's a little email field um, where you can uh, get updates and, and stay in touch. So drop your email in there or uh, reach out to me directly. Uh, if you've been listening for a while, you know how to do that. I'm B-R-H-E-A on Twitter, B-Ray. Um, and let me know uh, what, what it is that you're, if you're a remote worker or if you're a manager of a remote team, what challenges are you facing and what are you just wishing somebody would, would help uh, help you to solve so that will that'll do it for for this week. Thanks as always for listening. Let me know what you think and I will talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.